Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. And if you are new to my channel, you've never seen my face before, never watched any of my videos before, here on my channel I cover true crime content. All of the true crime content that I cover on my channel is a little bit more on the vintage side, so if that's something you might be interested in, maybe go down below and hit that subscribe button and quite possibly turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. Today we're going to be discussing an unsolved murder case from the 1970s, a case that as soon as I started looking into it, I was just taken aback. I was like, wow, this world is absolutely terrifying. But before we get into that case, today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by a company that I am so excited to finally be working with, a company that many of you have probably heard about before because it's been frequently talked about here on YouTube lately, and that is Casetify. Casetify is a tech accessory brand that has perfected high quality and uniquely designed cases for phones, AirPods, watch bands, and so many other accessories. You can also customize cases yourself. Their impact phone cases can protect your phone even from being dropped from six feet above because it's military grade and engineered with a two layer construction of Chi Tech material. Casetify has a variety of cases to fit anyone's aesthetic and they've collaborated with tons of artists, companies, and celebrities from Lisa Frank to Pokemon to Coca-Cola and many others. Other than my love for their designs and durability, one of my personal favorite things about Casetify is their care for causes. They've worked to plant trees with the Canopy Project, they've donated over 40,000 masks to healthcare workers, and all of their proceeds from hand sanitizers sold have gone to support coronavirus relief through global giving. So I'm sure you guys wanna see the cases that I picked out and all of my cases, if you know me at all, they're all very Gabby-esque. The one that I have on my phone right now is this black marble and it just says Gabby in this really dope font that I absolutely love. The other one I have is one with moons on it, which I think is really cool. And then I have one that is mirrored. Oh, I'm gonna blind you there. It's like rose gold mirrored. And this one, which just has roses on it because I love red roses. If you wanna try Casetify yourself, you can go to casetify.com slash gabbiolosis. My four top picks are on there as well if you wanna check those out and maybe get one that I have myself because I'm obsessed with the ones that I got. Maybe not with my name on it, maybe yours, but my picks are on there. And you can also get 20% off your order. So thank you Casetify so much for sponsoring today's video and let's get right into the case. This is the unsolved murder of 17-year-old Carla Walker. Carla Jan Walker was born on January 31st of the year 1957 in Tarrant County, Texas to parents Leighton Neal Walker and Doris Lindley Walker. By February of the year 1974, she was 17 years old and a junior attending Western Hills High School in Benbrook, a suburb of the south side of Fort Worth, Texas. Her older sister Cindy described her as a spitfire. Carla was a cheerleader who was quite popular. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Friends closest to her said everyone liked her. She was a sweet girl with no known enemies. Carla was the type of person that everyone got along with, and it was very easy for her to make friends. Carla overall was just an amazing person. She was a good girl. She didn't really get into trouble. She had good grades in school. She loved her car. That was like one thing about her. She absolutely loved her car. She was just overall a person that everybody who was close to her was just lucky to be close to her and know her so well because she was just a positive impact on pretty much everyone's life around her. Growing up, Carla dated a little here and a little there, but her first real love was a boy who went to her school. His name is Rodney McCoy. She and Rodney had been dating about a year. Friends described their relationship as a good one. Carla and Rodney absolutely adored each other. He was a senior while she was a junior, so he was a year older than her, and he was a starting quarterback on their high school's football team. He also played baseball. They were kind of described as the perfect high school couple. 
They were just good kids who were each other's high school sweethearts. They never fought. They just had so much love for each other. Just a young, innocent love. Rodney was a little bit different. Now, Carla grew up in a town where everyone grew up together, everyone knew each other. The people that you were in high school with were also the same people that you knew from middle school and elementary school and even pre-K. Rodney moved to the area in high school, so he was this fresh face. He was the new kid in school, and I think that's part of the reason that Carla was kind of gravitating towards him at first, she wanted to get to know the new kid in school. Rodney was a great kid. He was very attractive. He had all these ambitions and good qualities about him. And as soon as Carla's parents had met him, they basically just thought of him as another son. And they brought him into the family and he was just like another member of the family. Any of Carla's friends or family members who met Rodney pretty much right after meeting him, they just had the same opinion of him that he was good for Carla. They leveled each other out, their energies matched each other, they were just a great couple. Rodney was a senior, Carla was a junior, so that obviously meant that Rodney was going to be starting college a year sooner than she was. He had plans that next year to go to Texas Tech, and him and Carla decided that Carla was going to finish high school, she was going to finish her senior year, finish her credits, and then she would be moving to that area around Texas Tech with him. Yes, they were young, it was young love, but they really saw each other in one another's future, so they started making plans pretty early on. On Friday, February 15th, 1974, the day after Valentine's Day, Carla and Rodney attended a local beer bust on Benbrook Lake. This was a usual thing for local teenagers to do on a Friday night in the area. There were usually about 50 or so teenagers that attended these and some of them being a bit older than Carla and Rodney were at the time. At this party, there was a tiny incident with some of these older individuals. One of them was coming on to Carla and obviously this made both Carla and Rodney very uncomfortable. After the party was coming to a halt, a bunch of teenagers decided to go to a local burger place. The individual who was flirting with Carla and antagonizing Rodney at the beer bust was also at this burger place. It was more of an annoyance than anything and didn't end in any actual violence. The night finally ended and Carla and Rodney went home. The day that would change everyone's lives who knew Carla was February 16th of the year 1974. And on this day, Carla and her boyfriend Rodney attended a Valentine's Day dance. And Carla was extremely excited for this dance. She borrowed a light blue dress from her older sister Cindy and she was looking absolutely gorgeous that night. They overall had a really good time at the dance. They danced, they talked with friends, they just hung out, it was a great time, nothing out of the ordinary happened, nothing happened that would be viewed as a bad situation. Rodney said that of course the teenagers that attended the dance, the chaperones were very strict with no alcohol, but teenagers of course did drink a little bit and sneak some in, and Rodney said that they also had smoked a little bit of marijuana. Carla didn't really have a curfew this night, or at least that's what she told friends, and her and Rodney decided to leave the dance a little bit early because, of course, they were young and in love. They wanted to spend a little bit of time together before heading home for the night. They decided that they were going to go to a nearby bowling alley. This was a very popular hangout for young people in that area to just kill some time, go bowling, eat a little bit, have a few drinks. This was kind of the place that teenagers hung out at. So they decided that this was a good place to just waste some time, talk, you know, kiss a little bit in the car. So they went to this parking lot of this bowling alley and they decided to go in to use the restrooms and then they came back to the car. They were sitting in the car for a few minutes and Carla was leaning up against the door and they started kissing. Rodney says that they started kissing. Carla was leaning up against the passenger side door and out of nowhere, a person from outside of the vehicle opens the door. The car door just jerks open. Rodney goes to grab Carla from falling out of the car when he is repeatedly hit in the head by this unknown attacker. At this time, Carla was screaming, quit hitting him, quit hitting him. Rodney was hit very hard by a pistol. There was blood pouring down his face, getting in his eyes, it was everywhere. 
Rodney was paralyzed with fear, but was still fighting to grab onto Carla. The unknown attacker then puts a gun to Rodney's face and pulls the trigger a few times. In the split second after the first pull of the trigger, Rodney thought he had been shot, but after the next few clicks, he soon realizes there are no bullets in the gun. As the attacker is pulling Carla away from the car and out of her boyfriend's arms, she is screaming for Rodney to go get her dad. Rodney remembers Carla's last words being, go get help, I'll go with you, don't hurt him. When Rodney describes what the man looked like, he cannot remember much, he can't remember a face, it was more of like just a figure. He says that the man was definitely a white male and the man was not that tall. He was definitely not taller than six feet tall. He thinks he was about five foot ten and he was a bit stocky. After Rodney was violently attacked, he fell unconscious. He was actually knocked out. And when he came to, he looked around, Carla was gone. There was nobody in sight. Rodney does what anybody would do and he immediately starts heading for Carla's house. He gets to the house, he goes up to the door, he rings the doorbell and then just starts knocking as hard as he can. And Carla's family is inside, they hear this urgent knocking and they knew at that point that something was wrong. Carla's loved ones open the door and Rodney is standing there, he is covered in blood and he's just saying they've got her, they've got her. Rodney tells them everything that happened, he's still in a complete panic at this point. They all start freaking out, but Rodney still needs to be taken care of because he has scraped up, bruised up, he has a huge gash on his cheek. So they call an ambulance and he is taken to the hospital. Police are called and the police decide to go to the bowling alley parking lot to see if they can find anything and they don't find much. Rodney is taken care of, he's stitched up, he's allowed to go home, but of course going home, you don't feel any better. He is still completely worried about Carla, wondering who was responsible, who took her, who would do such a thing. And he also has this fear in the back of his head, you know, what if the person comes back? Who knows, the person could have thought that Rodney got a good look at them. Maybe they wanted to come back and, you know, finish the job when it comes to the other witness who was there. I mean, you never know. So Rodney, other than worrying about Carla and taking care of himself and trying to get some rest and clear his head and trying to help in the investigation, he's scared for his life as well. The FBI were called in pretty much immediately. And there was also a huge search done. It was actually the biggest search up until that point that the Fort Worth police had ever done. The Walker family had no idea who would do something like this though. Yes, there was past crime in the area, but why Carla? Everyone was questioned in the area during a time when everyone was still mourning. The main people really questioned were the teenagers who had also attended the Valentine's Day dance, but no one had much to add to the search. Most people saw Carla and Rodney before they had left, and that was the last time they all saw them that night before tragedy struck. For three days, this family went through hell, and I mean complete and utter hell. Carla's older sister, Cindy, said that they would just sit there for hours and hours and just hope and pray that Carla would just show up, that somebody would just drive by the house in the middle of the night and just kick Carla out of the car and she would come inside. Yes, she would have gone through something traumatic that changed her life forever, but at least she would still be alive. That's what they hoped more than anything, that she was just still alive. The family of Carla and authorities worked very fast to try to locate the missing teenager. And when they finally located her, she was not in the state that they hoped for. Three days later on February 20th, 1974, Carla's body was found. Her body was found in a culvert below a very rural road located south of Fort Worth, not far from Benbrook Lake. Her clothes had been ripped and her underwear was off of her body. Her promise ring, given by Rodney, was about 12 feet from the body. She had been beaten. She was covered in bruises and scrapes. She also had been sexually assaulted, and they located three pubic hairs on her that didn't belong to her, one on her body and two in her vaginal canal. They also recovered semen samples. The cause of death was strangulation. It was a sexually motivated homicide that seemed to look very predatory in nature. 
and it was determined she was killed not long after she was abducted because she still had undigested Taco Bell still in her stomach that she had eaten the night of the Valentine's Day dance. To top it all off, there was also morphine found in her system, so the killer had also drugged her. No evidence was recovered from the crime scene, no real witnesses and little leads to go off of. Finding her remains was really the time when it hit everyone the most. It was the most raw moment for them. Carla was gone and this nightmare was reality. This was yet again another case where authorities and family members felt stuck. While the investigation was still going on, the family held Carla's funeral and dozens and dozens of people showed up. From family to friends to people who were working on the case to people who lived in the town and had only heard of the tragedy. During the funeral, her loved ones did have it in the back of their head. What if Carla's killer is here right now? That is a thought that most people have during a funeral of an unsolved murder victim. Police took their time looking at everyone in the crowd, seeing if anything looked out of the ordinary, but not much sparked their interest. Carla's body had been located, all of the details from that night were collected, her cause of death was known, now they just needed to find out who was responsible. Of course, like any case, they look at the person who had last seen the victim, and unfortunately that was Rodney, a person who was also traumatized. So they interrogated Rodney intensely. Other than interrogating him, they also followed him to see where he was going throughout his day, seeing what he was up to. So other than Rodney going through all of this mentally and grieving over his girlfriend who was just murdered, police were questioning him intensely and he was basically a suspect at this point. But within time, police did determine that he was telling the truth about what happened that night. But it didn't take them long to have an actual suspect in her case. According to Detective Leah Wagner from the Fort Worth Police Department, one of the main suspects at the beginning of Carla's case was a man named Tommy Ray Neeland. Only about two months after Carla's murder, Tommy Ray Neeland attempted to abduct and sexually assault a teenager near the Arlington, Texas area. The girl was one of the lucky ones, and she managed to escape unharmed. The girl identified him as the man responsible, and Neeland went on to admit to committing three murders previously. Those three murders had coincidentally all taken place in Fort Worth, Texas, the area where Carlos did. Neeland was sentenced to life in prison, but was eventually paroled in the year 1987. He didn't stop there, though. He violated his terms of parole and ended up behind bars yet again. They never fully connected him to Carla's case. And around this time, there was another case that they were trying to see if Carla's case could be connected to, and that was the murder of Becky Martin. Becky Martin was a wife and mother of a young child who was abducted after attending a class she had at Tarrant County Junior College on February 7th, 1973, almost exactly a year before Carla's abduction. Becky, like Carla, was very petite and very beautiful. Her remains were found weeks after she went missing in a culvert, just like Carla. Also, just like Carla, near Benbrook Lake. Becky's case is also still unsolved to this day. There are so many people from authorities to people who have just researched into Carla's case that think that Carla's murder is connected to Becky Martin's murder, but of course, there's no one who's ever been fully connected to Becky's or Carla's, so trying to find out if one person was responsible for both is kind of impossible at this point. Then there's somebody who was actually indicted for Carla's murder. In the late 70s, a man named Jimmy Dean Sasser confessed to Carla's murder, saying he was their guy. He was the one responsible. The charges, though, were dropped because he completely recanted his confession, claiming he made it all up, and that was that. Now we get to the letter, and there are so many cases out there that have eerie letters that are connected to them, and this is another one of those cases. And this letter was actually not released to the public until April of last year in 2019, which was 45 years 
after the murder. This is a scanned version of the letter. It was addressed to Detective Lieutenant Oliver Ball. The detective on the case passed away before being able to release it to the public or do anything with it. And it was kept on file for about 45 years before the public got to see it with their own eyes. The part that is blacked out is writing that authorities have decided to keep private for right now from the public because it's the name of a suspect that has never been fully connected to the case. But the letter seems to read, kill or killed Carla Walker in Benbrook, then says sign 10100, then the postscript which reads, it is hard to say, but it is true, then again says sign 10100. Authorities believe the sign 10100 is referring to the police code for dead body. This letter is the main thing in today's time that police are hoping does something for this case. They're hoping that somebody comes forward and knows who wrote it or possibly recognizes the handwriting. This is the main thing that they are just hoping and praying does something for this case. But of course, this letter was released 45 years later, so the chances of somebody really knowing that handwriting all these years later and thinking they know who wrote it, I mean, the chances are very slim, but it's not impossible. Carla's older sister, Cindy, and younger brother, Jim, they are still constantly tormented by what happened to their sister. And unfortunately, Jim and Carla never really got the chance to become very close and have a strong sibling bond because when Carla was 17, Jim was only 12, and he says that to her, he was kind of just like, the annoying little brother. He says that nonetheless, she was still an amazing sister and it was her case that really sparked an interest in him in trying to get into law enforcement, but he was never able to fully get into law enforcement because he is visually impaired, he is legally blind. Cindy and Jim though promise that as long as they're still here, as long as they're still breathing, they will do anything they can to try to find their sister's killer, even after all these years. Rodney is still heavily involved in the case. It was an incident he thinks about almost every single day, and he was a victim in as well. He deals with the mental torture of trying to remember everything about the person responsible as he can. He's even gone under hypnosis to try and help, but most of what he recalls are things that he already remembers. To him, something that has always eaten him up inside was the door. According to him, when Carla was in her own car, she always wanted to have the doors locked if they were sitting there talking. And the night they were at the bowling alley parked, they were in his mom's car that he had borrowed for the night to go to the dance. The lock was a little bit different and harder to lock. When the attacker opened the door, the door wasn't fully locked. If the door had been locked the night could have ended differently. But of course, there was no way for Rodney to know that. Nobody just goes out and expects to have their significant other abducted and literally taken out of their arms. No one expects that. So of course, he wasn't thinking that at the time, but that is something that has really been in the back of his head all these years, if only that door had been locked. Carlo's case though is one of nine unsolved murder cases in the Fort Worth area from the 1970s that authorities are still investigating in today's time. Other than Carla, there's Brandy Marie St. Romain, a 25-year-old white female stabbed to death, Sheila Gotcher, an 18-year-old black female who was stabbed to death, June Ward, a 25-year-old white female who had been strangled, or Lee Prescott, a 31-year-old black female who had been strangled, Eleanor Stark, a 69-year-old white female who died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head, Lessie McGee, a 17-year-old white female who had been stabbed to death, Ruth Peters, a 76-year-old white female who had been stabbed as well, then the only male, which was Bill Holmes, who was a 29-year-old white male who had died of a result of blunt force trauma to the head. When you look at the victims, age and sex, six out of nine of the victims are young women. Now, it is possible that one of those other young women was also murdered by the same person that murdered 
Carla. Now we're going to talk briefly about a case that I had previously discussed on my channel. I think I covered it a few months back, maybe even a year back, and that is the case of the missing Fort Worth trio. This is a case that I think is one of my longest videos on my channel. It's a case that I dove into very deeply and it's a case that I'm very passionate about. Unlike Carla's case, this deals with three missing individuals though. It's not a murder case. 17-year-old Mary Rachel Trileka, 14-year-old Renee Wilson, and 9-year-old Julie Ann Mosley vanished from the Seminary South Shopping Center in Fort Worth on December 23, 1974, only less than a year after the murder of Carla Walker. If you want to learn more about that case in particular, I will have my video on it linked below in the description. You also have to remember that with the case of the missing trio of Fort Worth, there was also a note left behind, but this one was claiming to be written by one of the missing girls. Here's the letter from Carla's murder and the letter from the missing trio case side by side for anyone wanting a comparison of the handwriting. Personally, I don't think they look anything alike, but I know some people are going to want them side by side to view. With the case of Rachel, Renee, and Julie though, of course it's a missing persons case, so there's no DNA evidence that we have from a crime scene, so it's really hard to say if the person responsible for abducting them was also responsible for abducting Carla and taking her life. There was one man though who 100% believed that the case of the missing trio of Fort Worth and the case of Carla Walker were connected and that they were also connected to the murder of Becky Martin. The man was John F. Terrell and he was a police detective who passed away in the year of 2010, about 10 years ago. So he's not around today to have any more input about this case, but he believed that the three were connected and he believed that the person responsible was a man named William Ted Wilhoyt. William Ted Wilhoyt was a burglar that Terrell had put behind bars and was named a suspect in Carla's case at one time. Wilhoyt had gotten out and in 1975 the police were contacted when a man tried to cash two $500 saving bonds that had been reported stolen. The person who tried to cash them matched Wilhoyt's description, so Terrell and another officer went to Wilhoyt's residence. When they got there, he was standing in his yard and the first thing he said was, well, I was wondering when you were going to come after me for Carla Walker. Of course, the two officers were in complete shock and I think complete shock is probably an understatement for how they felt, but other than, of course, taking him to the station for the stolen bonds that he was trying to cash. They also brought him down to the station for questioning when it came to Carla Walker's case. Terrell had arrested Will Hoyt before and pretty much any time that Will Hoyt was arrested, it was pretty much all for burglary. So he sat down with a man who he had seen before, he knows his face, starts asking him about Carla Walker's case. And Carla Walker's case was one that Terrell was definitely interested in at the time and he had researched into a lot. So he knew the backstory of it and he wanted to see if Will Hoyt had anything to add to it. Maybe he had some inside information that only authorities knew. He wanted to see what he knew about this case, other than maybe confessing to it, which seemed to be where Will Hoyt was headed. At first, Will Hoyt kind of acted like he had some information to come forward with, of course, when they walked up and saw him and he immediately brings up Carla Walker's case. Seemed like he had some things to say, but when they got him down to the station, he didn't seem like he wanted to talk much. So Terrell thought a little bit and he decided that he was going to use some mind games on Will Hoyt. Terrell starts telling Will Hoyt, you know, you're a good man, you're a good Christian man, if you did something, you gotta come forward. You know, you can't live with that on your conscience forever. And this is what got Will Hoyt. He's sitting there and he just starts sobbing, he starts breaking down. He says that he can't live with this anymore. And as soon as he's to that emotional climax, somebody opens the door. And the person who opened the door was an officer who was coming in to question Will Hoyt about the stolen savings bonds. We don't know if Will Hoyt was responsible or not for Carla's murder, but 
at that point, it definitely seemed like he was going to confess something, whether it was having to do with Carla's murder or another crime that he committed. He was going to confess to something, and authorities were never in all this time able to get him back to that point. Will Hoyt served time for the fraud and was paroled in 1978. He relocated to another area where he went on to sexually assault a woman in her home and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. While in prison for that crime, he was questioned about the attempted murder of a girl named Janelle Kirby, who was shot five times in her face and managed to survive the attack. He was granted immunity for his testimony and confessed completely for the crime. He was paroled in 1992 and then again wound up in prison in 1995 for burglary and then paroled again finally in 2003. Now he is living free in Texas. 2003 was also coincidentally the same year that they reopened Carla Walker's case and started looking over all of the case files again and seeing if there were any new leads that they could follow. William Ted Wilhoyt was just another man that could be connected to her case that never came forward and confessed to anything and there's never been any substantial DNA evidence or any evidence at all that has connected him to her murder. It's really unfortunate that he's just free in today's time and he's never came forward with anything because it really seems like he had something to say about Carla Walker's case, whether that was confessing to it or saying he knew the person who did it. They were just never able to get him to that emotional, vulnerable state again, and he's never said anything else about it. And it's, like I said, very unfortunate because it's kind of just left up in the air. It's kind of just a cliffhanger. The person responsible for Carla Walker's murder has been free for 46 years, unless they're in prison somewhere, but I find that highly unlikely because they have ran the DNA evidence through their database and it hasn't been connected to anybody, so most likely the person responsible for Carlo Walker's murder is a free man just walking around. And in my mind, if this person had enough confidence to literally open a car door and snatch somebody with another witness right nearby, I think that they've probably done this before and they've probably done this after. As technology improves, more about this case will be discovered and more about pretty much every case out there will eventually be discovered, but it just kind of takes time. It takes time for all of the pieces to fit together and sometimes the right people coming forward. This case happened 46 years ago. That is 46 years of not knowing what happened to your loved one. That is 46 years of mental anguish and emotions going haywire. That is 46 years of not having answers, not having justice. Right now in this case, they have DNA evidence on file that they have yet to completely connect to an individual. And then they have this letter that is connected to the case saying that one person who has been crossed off the suspect list is responsible and people are hoping to find out who wrote that letter or find somebody who may know of the person who wrote that letter. Authorities are urging anyone who might have any information about the unsolved murder of Carla Jan Walker or the letter sent back in 1974 to Detective Lieutenant Oliver Ball to please contact Detective Leah Wagner at 817-392-4307. Remember that you can stay anonymous. This is a case that even though over four decades have passed, people still really care about it and people are still highly invested in it and people are still learning about it. I mean, there's going to be subscribers of mine who have never heard of this story who watch this video and will do a little bit of research on their own. I mean, this is a case that still just has so many people that want to see it solved. There was actually just this year a segment about her case done for the Oxygen show, The DNA of Murder with Paul Holes. It's very interesting. It goes into more of the DNA evidence side of the case while also talking to family members and friends and Rodney, who was her boyfriend. And they all kind of just talk about Carla and what they remember from that night at the Valentine's Day dance. and. 
It's very interesting. I highly recommend it if you do want to learn more about this case. Also, if you want to learn more about this case, Gone Cold did a five segment podcast series about Carla Walker's case. They talked directly to family members and friends of Carla and they also talked to specialists when it comes to reading autopsies and kind of going over her autopsy report again. It's very interesting. Definitely recommend them as well. So that will also be linked down below in the description. It's good to see people as a whole really try hard for a case that is so old because a lot of the cases that I discuss on my channel have been kind of lost in time and are only really popular in the areas that they happened in. This is definitely one of those cases that when you start reading more about it and start hearing about people's stories of Carla when she was alive, it does tug on your heartstrings. It does make you kind of choke up a little bit. It's just a case with so much emotion to it. So that is the case of Carla Walker and it's a case I believe can be solved and I know, I know I just recently said that on my last video, but it's like with this case, they have DNA evidence, you know, they have this male DNA on file that was not Rodney's. It was 100% the person who was responsible and it just, it just takes them matching it to the person. That's all it takes, you know, and I feel like that can happen. I feel like that is a possibility. I know the letter is a huge part of this case. It was just released to the public last year, but in my opinion, just as a YouTuber who's researching this case and discussing it on my channel, I feel like it's less likely that a letter is going to solve this case than actual DNA evidence. Like always, at the end of my videos, leave your thoughts down below in the comments and let me know what you think about this case. Let me know your opinions, any theories that you have. Let me know your overall thoughts about the murder of Carla Walker. I like to read through your comments, like to see what you have to say. And also, if you don't know what to say, leave some love down below in the comments for the family members and friends of Carla, anybody who knew her, because you never know who might come across this video. I've genuinely talked to family members before who watched my videos and read through the comments and just were taken aback by how many sweet comments there were directed towards them, so just, putting that out there. And of course, a huge thank you to Casetify for sponsoring today's video and sponsoring so many true crime YouTubers just like myself in recent times. And with all that being said, I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys. Also, before I go, I guess I gotta show Theta because I've literally gotten like 50 comments in the last week asking me why she wasn't in my last video. Why were you there? Why didn't you show up for filming? <laughs>